Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's been more than five years since I said that on this channel, and a lot of water has passed under the bridge in that time. Uh, as we live, we grow. And uh, the way I've been growing mostly is just old. Uh, and so it's changed a few things since I was last here. Uh, for one thing, my, my voice is not digitalized, and so I'm going to sound different. But there's another thing. I've got uh, dentures now, and so it kind of makes me lisp a little bit when I'm uh, speaking. I hope that's not too much of a problem uh, for those of you out there who are trying to understand what I'm saying. Now, I think we've got a notice up there about any questions you've got, not to put them in the chat, but rather to send them to my email address, which is right here on the screen. And... Uh, they'll get passed over to me as we go along. As I mentioned, uh, we've got a, a couple of questions that came in early, and so I'm a little bit more prepared for those, but otherwise I'm going to, um, you know, just uh, fly by the seat of my pants with the rest of them as they come in. The, the first question is quite a serious one, and it comes from a guy named Philip Walls, who, um, well, let me read his question first. Okay, he says, what happened to Shane? the boy who died after joining your cult in Texas. <laughs> As you can guess by the use of the word cult, uh, Shane's not one of our uh, best supporters. In fact, in this one question, he's done uh, at least three uh, fairly significant uh, false assumptions, or maybe it's a little bit more than a false assumption. Uh, we do face uh, this problem at times where people want to uh, kind of invent scandals where there are none. Nevertheless, uh, well, when I first heard of this from Philip, I thought it was just a total fabrication. I, I had no idea about any boy who died, you know, in our community. Uh, so I started checking around and discovered, yes, uh, there was a, a boy uh, who was actually a man. Okay, so we're not a cult. It was not a, not a boy. And he was not a member. He never joined the community. He just visited for about three days. That's the sum of the whole story, which I'll, I'll try to summarize in a bit more detail. So uh, there's a, a picture of uh, Shane now. Um, at first, uh, I, I had a little bit of communication with Shane, and he'd, he'd written to me. And uh, then he came and he visited uh, for three days in Dallas, Texas, in early September of 2019. He never joined, uh, but in his communication, both by email and uh, when he was there in person, uh, we found him to be quite a likable person, uh, fairly articulate, and uh, he came across as, you know, quite a nice guy. Uh, at the time, we were getting a lot of visitors. In fact, uh, when Shane arrived in Dallas, there were as many visitors as were members of the community. So the, the community was fairly busy trying to uh, meet the needs of all their guests. Uh, nevertheless, the, the visit went well. Um, like I said, Shane did come across as being a little eccentric in some ways. Um, he did such things as uh, making Nazarite vows uh, to always wear white, never eat sugar, salt, or meat and probably a few other things as well. But he was uh, particularly enthusiastic when it came, came to distributing uh, and witnessing with us on the streets. He came across well uh, with the, the general public, uh, was able to strike up a conversation very easily. Um, it also seems that he knew how to play chess, uh, which is a, a very helpful uh, skill in our community because so many of us like playing chess. Okay, I'm just losing my place here. Um, on the 7th of September, after uh, two or three days with us, Shane uh, posted on his Facebook page. Uh, this is the full comment from beginning to end. It's been fun so far. We gave out gospel. We give out gospel tracts and CDs, and then at night we have guitar and singing after dinner. It's very hot here in Texas, uh, but I'm making the best of it. So there he is out, uh, uh, not actually distributing. These pictures are some that we, we uh, got from his family's obituary video. So there we were on the 7th of September, a Saturday. It was a rest day uh, for us, and on rest days we often go to a park and just 
play a few games and, and have a nice picnic lunch. Those are sort of things they were doing on that day. Uh, sometime in the afternoon, they had their usual two-mile uh, run. Uh, Shane participated in uh, walking the course along with one of the other visitors as well. But then late in the afternoon, uh, that same Saturday, uh, Shane said that he wanted to go to the store, which wasn't far away from where we were, and he took off on his own. Uh, a few minutes later, one of our members left to visit a public toilet near the store. They noticed that Shane was talking to an ambulance officer standing next to an ambulance. Uh, didn't think much of it, just thought, you know, he'd struck up a friendly conversation with a, an ambo while he was uh, waiting for something. However, after the member returned to the park, one of our other visitors reported that they had seen Shane climb into the ambulance and drive off with the paramedic. Well, everyone was shocked. We, we tried texting, or they tried texting and phoning Shane, but they received no response. <clears throat> Phone calls were made uh, to several hospitals in the area until they located one, uh, a Veterans Administration Hospital, which said that Shane had been admitted there as a patient. Shane had been in the Navy, and so he was covered by insurance at the VA hospital. Three people drove to the hospital and asked to see Shane, but they were refused visiting rights. It appeared that Shane didn't want to see them. So over the next two days, that's Sunday and Monday, several unsuccessful attempts were made to contact Shane by phone. On Monday morning, Shane did reply, but he gave conflicting information. He seemed a bit confused. He shared nothing uh, about what had led him to call the ambulance in the first place. At one point, he said he wanted to come back and actually join the community, but then he went on to say that he was uh, getting a ticket to fly home. In either case, um, we assume that his health was okay and that probably later that same day he would have uh, been heading off to Michigan, where he came from. However, Unknown to us, Shane never did get back home, nor did we know until quite recently that he actually died in a bathroom there at the hospital two days after our last conversation with him. And that conversation was on Tuesday, September the 10th. He said a few disturbing things uh, at that time, uh, and we were assuming that these comments were coming from Michigan, that he was back home. One of the things he said that he, was that he was being offered as a sacrifice to Satan. And he talked about some unspecified mistake that he had made and that uh, uh, God was going to try to help him overcome. Well, these messages obviously take on a much deeper meaning now that we know what actually happened. Nevertheless, when his message were, messages stopped, we had assumed that he had just lost interest in communicating with us. His family was apparently notified, and on Friday, the 13th of September, announcements on Facebook, which we never saw at the time, let people know that he was on life support and possible organ donations were being planned before taking him off life support. His body was flown home to Michigan and cremated. The family held an inurnment service for him, which featured many photographs of Shane, the ones that we've been uh, showing in this video up till now. And uh, they produced in particular a beautiful uh, video uh, with these photos and with you know, significant songs that seem to identify with the anguish that uh, Shane must have been going through behind that great smile of his. And it is notable in all of the photos uh, that he has an infectious smile or had an infectious smile. Only God knows exactly where Shane was at spiritually when he died. But I know that just rehearsing what our own relationship was with him at that time three years ago has been a sobering experience for all of us who've been involved. Whether his problem really was physical or whether it was psychological, I think Shane was in the best possible place in either case to get 
the best possible treatment. The Veterans Administration Hospital in Dallas would probably know a whole lot more than I do about what was going on. Like happens so many times when there's a tragedy, um, you know, we will all tend to look back and say, what, what if, what if I had done something differently? And we've certainly been going through that as well. Because it seems to us that Shane was kind of making a, a, a last effort to reach out uh, and to find something that he could relate to and uh, move forward with in a positive way. There might have been things we could have done that would have helped him along that line. It certainly is deeply disappointing that we weren't able to give him the hope that he needed so badly at that time. The problem that we faced uh, in particular right there at the end was his double-mindedness, that we were getting some messages of you know, uh, reaching out and they're giving some other messages of uh, withdrawing and uh, pulling away from us. And that's pretty much the story as far as uh, Shane's concerned. Um, but it does kind of lead us to the second question that we have today. And that's a question from uh, a young man named Connor. And Connor wrote, how do I get over being double-minded? And my very simple answer to that is shock therapy. You know, something about shock. Uh, that kind of can can bring us out of uh, double-mindedness, can bring us out of confusion, uh, gets us back to, you know, really basic, basic uh, problems of human existence. Um, you know, people have, they talk about things uh, like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where shock therapy was used on Jack Nicholson in the movie and, uh, you know, with, with horrific uh, uh, effects. Nevertheless, uh, hospitals still use a type of shock therapy today, and what they've discovered is that they can put the patient uh, under an anesthetic, and so the patient uh, feels nothing and remembers nothing about the shock, but something happens, I guess, inside the cells or inside the brain, whatever it is, um, through that, that shock that uh, kind of clears things up for them a little bit and, and blows out the cobwebs. Well, the, the shock for us as Christians is death, or maybe more specifically, hell. Now, I know hell gets a pretty, a pretty bad uh, uh, spin as far as a lot of uh, opponents to Christianity are concerned, and even many Christians, uh, we find it quite embarrassing that we would talk about a God of love uh, making people suffer forever in hell. But I, I believe that hell is a very important uh, concept for us as Christians. We may differ about the, the details but it's God saying that we are going to be accountable one day. And it's quite a tragedy, really, that that's been taken out of the Christian message in so many churches. Uh, I recently uh, checked out a website where somebody had uh, had a near-death experience, and in that near-death experience, they encountered Jesus, and he was quite angry. He was angry at the way the guy had lived his life. And so this fellow was sharing it with a Christian website that specialized in stories about people who have uh, had near-death experiences. And their conclusion was, well, that wasn't Jesus. That was the devil talking to you. You know, uh, God's a loving God, you know, and, and all he's going to say to everybody is, hey, come on in, you know, uh, heaven's big. We can, we can uh, handle you all. But that, uh, that makes me kind of uh, skeptical about the positive ones. Because uh, I have no doubt that every one of us, if we had to stand before Jesus right now, uh, would be shaking in our boots at the number of things that we've done, done wrong, the number of people we've hurt, and especially our, our relative uh, indifference to the God who created us and the God who sent his son to die for us. So that the whole gospel has been turned into a super sweet, selfish, lazy, do-nothing uh, experience that that's going to lead to a lot of double-mindedness, or another term we use for it is lukewarmness. So I, I believe there's a lot of you guys out there listening now, not just, not just Cameron who asked the question, um, uh, Connor, sorry, who asked the question, but uh, a lot of people out there who are still sitting on the fence because you think, well, that's safe. It's not, it's not at all safe, no. The only thing you get, get from riding a fence is a sore middle. What you need to do is to jump off that fence and be either hot or cold. 
That's what Jesus says. He doesn't like lukewarmness. It makes him sick. Now, Jesus said the way to heaven's a narrow way. So, you know, if, if you're doing nothing, you've already made a decision. You've made a decision to do nothing. And I don't think God's going to be very, very impressed with that. You need, you need to be shocked. There's a famous uh, preacher back in the, the 19th century uh, who was a, a revivalist in England, I believe. And he used to say, uh, someone asked him, you know, how he succeeded in getting people sort of converted to Christianity. And he said, I dangle them over hell for about 10 minutes. And then, then I tell them about the love of God. <laughs> we need a whole lot more of that. But everyone's afraid to dangle someone over hell, afraid to consider the possibility that your, your best friends, your loved ones, your relatives uh, may be in hell right now even though they, they did nice things and you know, maybe they were respectable, the, the point is that they did not take God seriously. And we need to take God a lot more seriously. So get out of your double-mindedness. And that kind of leads me on to another question. Let me see if I can find it there. That was from uh, Rich Rollins. Rich Rollins uh, wrote in and said, uh, what is the gospel? And uh, gosh, there's so many different answers you can give to some of these questions, but uh, it's good to make us think and simplify and look at it. And the gospel, I see it in two ways. Uh, one is the gospel is that the creator of this universe, the one who put us here on this planet, is interested in us, us enough to come down here and to talk to us. Now, so many people think, you know, uh, I don't know what God wants. You know, I haven't, I've never met him. I've never, you know, had a conversation with him. It's every man for himself. God's just an imagination, and et cetera, et cetera. But he did. He went to the trouble of coming down here in the form of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then, after Christ ascended back to heaven, he gave us at least three, if not four, books which supernaturally tell us what God wants us to hear. But what's happening? What's happening in the church all over the world today? Nobody, I repeat that, nobody is reading that those four Gospels. If they look at it at all, it's just to find some little verse like John 3.16 that can, they can interpret to mean anything they want it to be. But when it comes to actually listening to Jesus and doing what Jesus tells us to do, we ignore him. So one part of the Gospel is that God came to speak. Now, another part of the Gospel is that when he did speak, he offered hope of eternal life. That's wonderful that we could possibly Live forever. Now, what atheist can you give you that kind of hope? But I'm, I stress the word hope because what's being preached is basically the, you know, the uh, uh, near-death experience thing, that everybody who dies goes to heaven. God says uh, everything's hunky-dory, you know, go back and uh, be a nice guy. But they don't change. They don't change in the ways that Jesus asked us to change. And, and nobody wants to face the fact that the same Bible which tells us God is a God of love, also tells us that he's a God of wrath. And we're going to have to face that wrath. So get off the fence. Stop being double-minded. Stop being lukewarm. You're in the worst possible place spiritually while you're like that. And make your decision. Who are you going to serve? Jesus said it. Very few are going to choose to serve him. Most of you just go back to being systemized. Well, that's, that's where you choose to, to live your life. You're also choosing where you're going to spend eternity. All right, well, that's enough of a, a rave for me on the subject of double-mindedness and, uh, and what is the gospel. I, I think we got another question here. I have one. Okay. All right, somebody uh, wrote in about, um, who was it? Wrote in about wanting to ask for more information about divorce and remarriage. Now, some of these questions uh, are best answered, actually, by videos that exist on our, our uh, channel already. So there's a video just called Divorce and Remarriage. Google Divorce, and you'll get it. Uh, there's a one-minute one that's more or less a trailer for the 14-minute the one. But that 14-minute one will explain, uh, I think, most of what you need as far as understanding where Jesus stood as far as divorce and remarriage is concerned. Um, and in particular, it deals with that little phrase, except for fornication. That's the little loophole uh, that people have tried to turn into a, a, you know, a superhighway uh, for divorce and remarriage. But it's, it's not the loophole you, that they think it is. 
So uh, check that out. Uh, in the live stream, we're trying to cover things that are not covered already in some videos, uh, but that doesn't work out real well either because I don't know how much each of you know on these subjects, and, and I don't want to be just sort of uh, saying stuff you've heard a hundred times already before. Uh, but I also understand that if I say something that sounds a little bit radical and new, then that, uh, you know, uh, that leads to new questions. And, and we don't have that back and forth where, you know, you, you can say, yeah, but what about? And then I can answer that. Uh, so I'll just do the best I can based on the, on the questions as they're sent in. Okay, let me see what I got here. This is one from Mark. Who do you think is the bigger hypocrite? A Christian? who doesn't obey Jesus, or a conspiracy theorist who perpetuates the system by working for it. Take a little while to digest that one. Um, I think I'm kind of being set up here a little bit. but um, Okay, so we've got a, a, a Christian who uh, doesn't obey the teachings of Jesus. So, I mean, that's to me, that's the ultimate in, in hypocrisy. Uh, and that's the thing we, we confront a lot here in this channel. So I, I hardly even have to read the second half of the sentence, and, and I'm going to say that, you know, fake Christians are the biggest hypocrites. Uh, they're worse than, they're worse than uh, atheists, really. But then he, it's compared with a conspiracy theorist, let me uh, say, who perpetuates the system by working for it. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I guess the hypocrisy we're talking about here is a conspiracy theorist who says, for example, that uh, the... the the government is corrupt, uh, but then still goes out and campaigns for their candidate. Um, I don't know. I don't want to get really too involved in that. I mean, most people know that uh, I'm, I'm pretty uh, down on uh, most of the conspiracy theories. I think they're just distractions. They, they take us away from actually following Jesus. Uh, a positive thing is that at least some people are starting to question the system, but I don't think they're going to find any answers. Uh, until they listen to Jesus. And so they need to kind of move over into that other category along with uh, the, the, the professing Christians who are not following the teachings of Jesus. Let's all become professing Christians who are following the teachings of Jesus and let the conspiracy theorists and the, the hypocrites take care of themselves. Okay, another one here. Uh, this one's anonymous. Uh, what is the hardest part of following Jesus after we've forsaken all, sold everything, and given it to the poor. All right, well, that's what I'm, I'm fairly prepared for with a very short answer. Um, we, we've often said over the years that uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, and so that's the first thing you really have to deal with, and that's why Christ starts by saying, leave your nets, you know, walk away from the tax collecting, whatever it is, come and follow me. So they had to leave all that, and, and that challenged greed, Okay. But the, the, the next biggest problem that I think comes for all of us is pride. You know, and, and uh, pride keeps us from being able to love because um, we just have so, so many people, and I'm sure a lot of them are, are watching right at the moment, who tell us, okay, I like what you're saying, but I'm going to do it by myself. You know, uh, why do they do that? Well, because of pride. I mean, you know, if you're going to try to work with other people, you're going to have to uh, submit to their ideas occasionally. You're going to have to do things their way occasionally. And that, that takes humility. So I believe pride is the thing that, that stops us from so much more growth as far as uh, uh, our Christian re relationship with God is concerned. And okay, another one here. They're still coming in. This one comes from someone named Andrew. If God is so loving, why does he make us pick to serve him or be tormented forever and ever? Um, I feel like it's going back to what I, I just said uh, originally, but I, I can say some more on that. This is, this is one of these dangerous things. Beware, beware, you know, red flags go up uh, that people are worried I'm going to say something heretical, you know, sort of um, off the top of my head. And so let me uh, preface this by saying this is something I've thought about in theory, for years, okay? I, I'm not preaching this. Uh, and that is that maybe, just maybe, this torment forever in hell is a bluff, okay? Part of the shock therapy. I didn't quite finish my thought about shock therapy. You know, that they, 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 they still do it, but the people don't feel it, okay? Uh, and it still works. And so, so we, we need the shock, you know, 
to, to help us to be more stable, not to be double-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So God uses hell. Now, if you try to, to uh, research the subject of hell and find proof texts or try, try to find a chapter that sort of uh, lays it all out, it's, you won't find it. You know, there's just little bits here, bits there. And, and as some people have pointed out, Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, uh, some of the words for hell uh, just mean the grave. Others for hell mean a fire outside the city where they, 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 they burned rubbish. Okay, we put all of that together uh, with the, the lake of fire concept and uh, torment forever in hell. But the, the point of it is that knowing that somehow or other we're going to have to be accountable to God. This God of love, okay, tells us he's also a God of wrath and judgment. And, uh, you know, for any atheist who feels sort of smug about the fact that Christians serve a God who would, you know, uh, let people suffer forever in hell who were, you know, otherwise good, respectable citizens, need to consider what evolution teaches. <laughs> you know what evolution teaches? The only way you're going to improve is you've got to kill off all of the weak ones. Now, does that sound like a, a, an improvement on Christianity? You know, maybe hell is part of God's evolution. It's to kill off the majority and to save a remnant uh, to make the world, to make a new world the way it should be. So, you know, try to fit all this together when it comes to your attempts to tell God how to do his business. I think he knows what he's doing, and he has a right, he has a right to make every one of us suffer torment forever and ever. You know, let's, let's take this little time when we're not in hell, we're not necessarily suffering torment, uh, to, to thank him for that. And, you know, it could pay off dividends eternally if we just stop being so judgmental about what God's allowed to do. Okay, they keep still coming in. This one's from Michelle. Do you think the anti-Messiah is on the scene, but just not fully revealed yet? And if so, who do you speculate he is? Now, actually, this goes with one I think that came in early um, that uh, I hadn't... Uh, uh, sort of included it because the new ones started coming in. Um, questions about, you know, like, who is the Antichrist? Who are the two witnesses, you know? Um, I'm wondering why that matters. See, I, I don't think it's, it's important other than finally when it's all happening, it's kind of confirmation that the, the numerical value of the letters in the name of the Antichrist will add up to 666. So after the fact, you might see that, okay? But for right now, the question is, what are you doing? Maybe you're the Antichrist. <laughs> you know, maybe you and I are, what, are the two witnesses too, okay? We can go bo both extremes, but it's not going to make any difference if we don't have a, a relationship with Christ uh, that will see us through even the most boring, uh, uh, ordinary experiences of, of life. We need to put God first and, and let the Antichrist or the anti-Messiah uh, take care of himself and let God take care of him. So the, the, the best practical way of being uh, prepared is not to be dependent upon the mark or the mark's predecessors, you know, which is money in general, but it's going into a lot of electronic type stuff now. It just hasn't been implanted in the back of the hand for most people. So let's, let's look at those areas and uh, stop wasting our time with theories. I mean, every world leader that comes along is accused of being the Antichrist by somebody. And they do some kind of tricks with their names to get the, their letters to add up to 666. Now, this other question was asking specifically about Elon Musk. They said the letters of his name added up to 660. Uh, and that uh, sometimes, I guess, he added an, an E, Elon Musk or something, and then it, it would add up to 665. Pretty close to 666. Uh, so I thought, well, I'd check into that, you know, because I, I don't know of any that have, have come that close. And so I checked into it. It's like 445 in, in Gematria, you know, the Hebrew uh, spelling of Elon Musk. There's something called uh, English Gematria. And it's just another contrived thing. You basically take letters by how they appear in the, in the alphabet. A is 1, B is 2, three is, C is 3. And uh, you add them up. Uh, but English gametria goes even farther than that. 
Then you add up the names, uh, the numbers in the name of, I think it's the mother of the, uh, the person you think is the Antichrist. And then you do something where you divide one by seven and the other by 12. Uh, it, it's, it's just way too contrived. So I'm, I'm really not interested. Uh, you know, one day I will be somebody, you know, fairly significant. Um, and Elon Musk is fairly significant, whose name actually does, in Hebrew gematria, add up to 666. Well, then, you know, we, we, we should start taking notice. But I imagine by that time we'll see plenty of other evidence um, that this guy is the one. Okay. This is from uh, Jade. Jesus said that we should not use vain repetitions in Matthew chapter 6, but in Luke 11, he tells a parable about persistently praying. What is the difference? Well, I think it's kind of an easy one, (laughs) because what he says is to pray secretly. Okay? Um, And I don't know, maybe maybe that's not as relevant as I think. The, the, The thing is, Praying vain repetitions is uh, different to um, importunity is the word that's used as far as the widow praying to the judge uh, in that it was a persistence. Okay, the vain repetitions usually have to do with the more times I can say it, you know, and, and, and obviously to say, uh, say something over and over again very quickly, it's not going to give you much time to think about what you're saying. And so it's like that kind of magical chant, we're going to do a spell, or we're going to send out a prayer letter, and we're going to get uh, you know, 1,000 people or 10,000 people to all say, heal my son, heal my son, or, or uh, give me a beautiful wife. And if enough of us say that, well, then God's going to do it. Um, in particular, bear in mind that the illustration about the important woman, widow, who, you know, who begged the judge and begged the judge and begged the judge until he finally gave in, follows up by saying, uh, even so, God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So most of this vain repetition stuff is, is pretty selfish. I want this, I want this, I want this. You know, and and that's, not going to, that's not going to affect God. But if you want the Holy Spirit, yeah, keep asking for it every day, every day of your life. Uh, you know, I just uh, have so much need of God's Spirit because my own spirit keeps getting in the way. I get impatient, I'm unloving. Um, and so I have to keep asking God for more of his spirit. But it's not a vain request. It's one that God wants us to ask. Now, okay. <laughs> I see a question in our controversial uh, bin here. And I see a name at the top of it. All right. Brian, we're going to give you a little bit of an audience here. And Brian's kind of been my, uh, what might you call him, my arch enemy. You know, he's kind of proud of the fact that uh, um, he's obsessed, obsessed with uh, uh, wiping me out. Anyway, what, here's Brian's uh, uh, question. How is your relationship with your own four children these days? Do you see them or any of your grandchildren very much? Now, Brian wouldn't ask a question like that unless he already knew the answer. What he's trying to do, of course, is to prove something, whatever, you know, um, by uh, rubbing in the fact that uh, uh, most of my children have rejected the message of living by faith. I mean, uh, one was, I think, 30 years old by the time he rejected it. So uh, I would say to my wife, you know, well, we had 30 years, really good years together with that son. Uh, How many parents can say that? In the end, uh, they have to make their own choice. And they chose other things. And we respect them for that choice. Uh, We don't agree with them, but they have that right. Um, Okay, so there's my answer, Brian. Okay, until next time, which I hope is a good long time away. Uh, I'm just going to adjust my camera a little bit there. So, I have another one here. No, actually, I think I might have missed one that came in earlier. It's not that one. All right, well, we'll try this one. Well, Lex Luthor, okay, yeah, he's one that wrote in during the week anyway. How must we sell all, give up all we have, and be homeless? Do you know God will feed you and protect you? Uh, Let me just share uh, my own experience, okay? I just simply, about 50 years ago, 
uh, read uh, in the Gospels uh, what Jesus did and what his followers did. And they left everything and, and he told them to go out and all the world and preach the gospel. And so I didn't have an understanding at that time about any, any promises of God's provision. But I knew that if God was saying that's what we're supposed to do, then that's what we needed to do. And in my human understanding, I assumed I was going to starve to death. You know, but I thought, well, God's saying, you know, better a month preaching the gospel before you die they just sit around all your life waiting for something that never happens. So I, I've never been really strong on telling people about uh, miraculous provision, even though that's become, you know, almost commonplace within our community. Uh, God does provide, and he provides it in many different ways. But he doesn't always provide in the way that we want, and he doesn't always provide the things that we think we want. He, he definitely has provided our needs and uh, has definitely exceeded that a lot of times. We just get so many good things that, you know, we, we have overweight problems amongst several of our, our members, so we're, we're hardly starving to death. And we, uh, we commented recently, I suppose, in, particularly in relationship to this uh, question about Shane, that we've been going for almost 50 years now, and nobody, nobody in our community has ever died. We've been sick, you know, we've been in dangerous situations, but so far, nobody's died. I think it's a pretty amazing record, really. And I don't claim, okay, join our community and you'll never die. No, if you start living by faith, you have to be able to count the costs and say, well, uh, I, I'm ready to lose my life for Christ. The point is, I need to obey him and take him seriously. Now, the question was, how must we sell all? Um, not sure <laughs> uh, exactly what that how means. Uh, we use garage sales uh, for possessions. Uh, we advertise uh, large items when we're selling everything. Am I, am I getting on the right track here? I'm not sure uh, what the question is leading to. Um, the thing is, we, we try to get rid of stuff. Sometimes you get down to the end, and, and there are things like uh, books and clothing that are pretty hard to sell even in a garage sale these days. Um, but uh, some distractions going on here. I'm getting sidetracked. But anyway, um, we, we sometimes have things like clothing and books and, and trinkets and things we just take to an op shop and, uh, and donate to them. And I imagine that they throw a lot of that stuff out anyway because they would have the same situation. So we forsake all, and I, I think probably that the how question is, uh, for in most people's minds, is, uh, well, then how do you survive? You know, you know, and we just think it's, it's like assuming the earth is round, that everybody knows that you, you can't live without money. Um, but in this case, uh, that's a false assumption. You know, uh, it, it, in fact, we've never never eaten money. I've never worn it as clothing. You know, never built a house out of money. You can you can use money as a means of exchange to get somebody else to do something who's not willing to do it for free. But in the kingdom of heaven, everybody would do things for free. So we start it by doing things for free, and occasionally, you know, people like what we're doing and they donate. That's one of the most common ways uh, that God provides our needs. I hope that's enough, at least, on that, that question for now. And I've got another one here. What do you think, this is from William, what do you think is the best way to get someone to change? Uh, and then in parentheses, for the better. <laughs> I hope for the better. Ah, gosh, there's a trouble here when these things are live. You know, I, I need to, to come up with some, some good answers uh, just off the top of my head. Uh, I kind of wish I knew a, a, a better answer to that one myself. I'd like to see people change. Uh, I think the, the primary thing is to focus on changing ourselves. You see, if any one of us changes ourselves, we have changed the world. We're part of the world, aren't we? You know, um, and... You know, I suppose in that sense, everybody's changing the world. The question is, are we changing it for the better or are we changing it for the worse? And I think when we do concentrate on changing ourselves, uh, that can become the best way to change other people. I get uh, teenagers writing in, living at home and, and, and saying, you know, um, I'm trying to convert my parents. I like what you're saying. And I say, don't. Don't try to convert your parents. Uh, they're taking care of you, you know. Uh, they're not going to take kindly to you lecturing them, you know, on, on something you haven't even put into practice yourself yet. 
uh, just concentrate on being a good son or daughter, uh, being helpful, being respectful, uh, doing all the good things you can as an expression of your faith in God. Uh, and if there's going to be any change, they'll decide. You know, uh, A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And so we cannot force a person to change. We're flat out trying to force ourselves to change. And, and that's where it, we have to go back to uh, asking and keep on asking for more of God's Spirit so that we can change. And then his spirit will change other people as a result. Okay, there's another anonymous one. Jesus says, Woe to those who cause these little ones to stumble. These people who cause others to stumble are essentially needed, but they are doomed. Will God cut them any slack? Uh, this is kind of the reasoning that uh, is sympathetic with Judas. You know, like Judas had no choice. You know, um, we would, never would have been saved if somebody hadn't betrayed Jesus. Um, it's a misunderstanding, I think, actually, of, of uh, God's, uh, God's uh, relationship with humankind. Uh, we are not predestinated to be bad guys. It's just that God can see the future. And so he sees what we're going to choose, and he works his plans around that. Okay, we have free choice. And so somebody who causes one of these little ones to stumble, uh, it says it would be better if a millstone were tied around their neck and he was thrown into the sea. So, yeah, they will be punished, and they will be punished because they chose to do the wrong thing. So we need to be careful uh, about what we do. You will be accountable, and uh, uh, this question seems to assume that it's God's fault if you did something wrong. I, I, I can't accept that at all. All right, this one comes from Floor. Can you share your thoughts about the teaching of not judging others? All right, it's another one where there, there is a proof text, and, and to my embarrassment, it's actually in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, which is my favorite uh, uh, source for teaching. Uh, there is a verse in the Sermon on the Mount, and then I think uh, over in Romans, uh, Paul says something similar, against judging, okay? So everyone knows that. Judge not that you will not be judged. The problem is that everyone judges. And so I prefer the one over in John's Gospel where Jesus says, judge fairly. For the same uh, criteria you use for judging others will be used on you. Uh, that's the realistic one. You see, when someone says to me, ah, but you're judging, <laughs> I have to laugh because they just judged, didn't they? When they said I'm judging, they've judged me as having judged. We can't escape that. We have to make judgments. And if you get a concordance uh, or you do a search for the word judge and judgment in the Bible, you'll find that on the whole, it's a good, it's a virtue. Uh, the word um, hypocrite means not critical enough. You know, we're not, we're not, uh, we need to be critical. I mean, obviously of ourselves first, but we need to know, you know, the difference between right and wrong. God wants us to, to learn to make those kind of judgments. And uh, that's why I, I, I lean more to the other, other verses. I, I had a, a possible interpretation that um, went with the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged, King James Version. Uh, somebody claims that it doesn't work in the Hebrew. I'm not sure. Look at it this way. How, let's change it to presume, okay? A presumption is a type of ju judgment. Do not presume that you will not be judged. Can you see the difference? Don't judge or assume that you won't be judged. We're going to be judged, okay? And we are going to judge. What we need to learn how to do is to judge fairly, okay? And, you know, uh, Jesus talked about straining at gnats and swallowing camels. You know, how many people write in and say, ah, you know, uh, voice, you've got uh, glasses, I see. You know, who paid for those glasses? You know, you know while they're sitting there in, in, in their, their uh, you know, luxury cars and, <laughs> and uh, designer suits, uh, straining at an ad about the fact they got a pair of glasses. Or, or if I got them from the government, which I did, 
then I've ripped off the government. You know, they're straining at gnats. That's the wrong kind of judgment. You know, we need to start judgment with ourselves, but we also, you know, need to be able to tell between right and wrong, good and evil, what's going to help you grow as a, a Christian and what's not going to help you grow as a Christian. And that kind of judgment is very definitely needed. Another anonymous one. What are some of the ways that we can preach the gospel? Um, <clears throat> there's a story about one of the saints in the Catholic Church who, who had, I, I guess, you know, a community. And one of the newer members in his community uh, heard that he was going into town for the day uh, to preach. And he said, oh, can I come along? Because he'd, he'd, never, he'd never seen this saint preaching. So they went to town and they took care of some business and they, they met some people and, and um, you know, just did fairly ordinary things all day long and came home. And the novice was a bit disappointed and asked the saint, you know, why didn't you preach? I want to hear you preach. He said, we were preaching all day long, you know. Uh, uh, preaching should just be a, a natural, spontaneous part of our Christian faith. Uh, there, there are situations where we do kind of have to push ourselves, um, but if it's constantly pushing ourselves, constantly unnatural, uh, it may not really be the kind of preaching God's looking for. It says in, uh, in the 8th chapter of Luke that uh, Jesus and his disciples went everywhere showing the kingdom of heaven. How were they showing the kingdom of heaven? They were living together. You know, who does that? Uh, they, they didn't have jobs. They were trusting God to take care of their needs. Who does that? You see, it's, it's, uh, our lifestyle becomes a powerful sermon uh, when it's so different. You know, they come to us. And they, and they say, you know, <laughs> explain, please explain. How do, you, how do you live? How do you survive, you know? Uh, is there really such a God who, who can take care of you? And so the sermons just come out of, out of normal circumstances. Uh, also, you know, as a community, we go out on the streets, and, and uh, that can be very difficult for new members who come in and, you know, almost all say, well, I'm not a preacher, you know. Um, we, we distribute printed literature. They didn't have literature in Bible times, um, but it's it's... Kids can do it, you know, almost anybody can do it. A non-believer could do it, you know. We could hire people to distribute our literature in, in some ways we do. I mean, we take that chance anytime we talk to the media that some of the truth will get out through them uh, despite whatever other agenda they might have. Uh, because the message is there in, in print, uh, we are able to witness in that way out on the streets to give somebody, you know, a, a written message. Um, I, I think I earlier mentioned, too, about uh, teenagers witnessing to their parents just by being uh, good sons and daughters, uh, by working hard, by being honest, by being loving and considerate. All those sort of things are, are forms of preaching. So the, the sky's the limit. Uh, I, I think the word witnessing is also used instead of preaching. I, I kind of like witnessing because witnessing means I, I just, I saw something, you know. <laughs> Somebody said, what did you see? Well, I saw God providing my needs, you know. Um, that that's a witness should be very, very simple. You, you know, you, you shouldn't have to write out a speech if you appear in court as a witness. The court will ask, you know, did you see such and such? Did they, they do such and such? And you'll say yes, no, or I can't remember. That's witnessing. You're just being who you are and sharing what you have experienced. The, the thing is, because we're living by faith as a community, we have, we have something pretty powerful, you know, to... to just talk spontaneously about, uh, as I've done here when people say, you know, how does God provide your needs? Um, when we take Jesus seriously, people are going to ask those kind of questions. Uh, and they come and they, they, they visit us and they see how we live. And all of this becomes a sermon. And that's why Jesus said, preach the good news of the kingdom of heaven. Now, Everywhere else, people think they're preaching the gospel when they say, you know, uh, follow these five spiritual laws and you get a ticket to heaven. No, <laughs> that was not what Jesus was doing. That's not what Paul was doing. You know, that's not what the early Christians did. You know, um, we live and show the kingdom of heaven in our lives seven days a week. Okay, this one's from Bryant. Do you think fear is one of the biggest reasons for someone to not follow Christ? If so, 
how do people overcome that fear? Uh, well, fear is the opposite of faith. So uh, if it's about living by faith and you're not doing it, you're living by fear. That's right. That's exactly what most of the world is doing. We don't always, you know, sort of express this in paranoid terms, um, particularly with regard to death, for example. We just don't talk about it, you know. Uh, we, we talk about, you know, sort of uh, passing away or, um, you know, uh, euphemisms for, for death because we don't even want to say the word. Um, people are frightened. You know, everyone, even in rich countries, I mean, Elon Musk would still, you know, kind of subconsciously be worried he might starve to death or freeze to death if he didn't have money. You know, that's, that's everywhere. Now, it doesn't come out in, in, in so many terms, but that's the bottom line of it. If, if I did not have money, I'm a goner. And that's not, that's not faith, that's fear. So faith says, well, live or die, what matters is, is God, because he goes beyond, on beyond this life. He's eternal. Uh, how do you get people to change? Uh, no, how do you get people to overcome the fear? Um, that goes back to an earlier question, doesn't it? Shock. Um, when, when they, this is a beautiful thing about anyone dying. It, it sobers a lot of people because it's something we, we run away from, you know, until we face with the funeral. And at least for the short period of the funeral, people become a little bit somber about death. And you've got to just like someone goes to a, met, a wedding, they remember when they got married. Someone goes to a funeral, you're going to think about when you were buried. And, and we need to think about that more often. To me, that's the, that's the greatest key to enjoying life, is to live every day like it's your last. Maria has sent this one. Why is it when people converted in the past, the apostles had to lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what that meant, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much point in me even going into it. I, I know certainly in, in churches they do that in a ritualistic kind of way, you know, uh, receive ye the Holy Spirit, you know. Um, maybe people need need something that they invisible that they can put their faith in, but on, on the whole, I don't think that's a, a necessity. Um, you don't even need an apostle to do it. You know, it's the Holy Spirit that does it. So pray and ask God for the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of things that are, are mentioned in the Book of Acts that you know I, I don't feel a necessity to imitate. I mean, that's just what they were doing then, and I, I believe they made some mistakes as well. I'm not saying it's a mistake to lay hands on somebody uh, and, and say a prayer, but uh, my, my pattern's there in the teachings of Christ. So laying hands on someone is not a big deal. Okay. Uh, this one comes from Charles. What is considered a legitimate marriage? Where does God draw the line between married and just committing fornication. Well, that's a, that's a difficult one. A lot of minds have uh, struggled with that one. Um, I guess one of the things I, I would ask is, why, why are you asking the question? Um, and it usually, we're coming back to divorce and remarriage, which was mentioned earlier. Um, it, it usually is because people want to play around and, and then later be free to marry or remarry, if that's the case. Uh, definitely there are two words in the Old Testament. There's fornication and there's adultery. Okay, so fornication is what single people did. Okay, that was sinful as well. Okay, but adultery was especially sinful, and that's why it rates as one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, adultery is because you're messing with someone else's marriage. You know, and God hates that. You know, uh, a marriage is to be for life. And so don't mess around with someone's marriage. Now, this question is, is, you know, where's the line between fornication and adultery? And this is particularly difficult in uh, the modern Western world today because you've got people all over the world who never went through a ceremony, you know, to, to get married. Uh, but they're still married, in particular if they have children. I think that's pretty much universally understood. Whatever happens with a ceremony or without a ceremony, if, if uh, a couple have sex and the woman becomes pregnant, you have a child, 
you are married. You made that choice, you know, and they used to call that a shot, shotgun wedding. You know, it was not a, a wedding that uh, uh, maybe the, the in-laws felt very good about, but they understood that if, if some guy was going to mess around, then he, he was married to their daughter, and he was responsible for that child uh, if she became pregnant. So, uh, you know, that's definitely a, a line not to be crossed. There are other forms of commitment, however. You can have a couple that's lived together for three or four years and never had children, uh, but that's, that's obviously a commitment. You see, and ultimately, that word commitment, I think, is important in determining what a marriage is. Um, you know, we, we become kind of hooked on these marriage licenses uh, that are issued by the government. You know, well, that's just a government thing, you know, I guess, to kind of keep things a little bit clear on who's married to who uh, in, in case of legal issues and things like that. But the commitment is between you and God. So uh, if you've been committed to somebody in the past and then you changed your mind, well, you divorce them and you're not free to remarry. Okay, another one here just came in from Uriel. Who would you say Melchizedek is? Is he God in the flesh before Jesus? Um, ah, Melchizedek, for people that are not aware of it, Melchizedek was uh, a guy that sort of popped up in the Old Testament as a, as a priest for Abraham, I believe it was. Um, and it's kind of never explained, you know, why Abraham... Uh, paid tithes to Melchizedek. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a, a Jew, you know. That came a few generations later. He was a pagan, and yet there was some priest that he gave this, this to. And uh, th there is one theory that that was Jesus appearing to him. Um, I don't know. I, th I think I'd, I still have to ask with a question like that, uh, what difference does it make? Um, it, it's just all theory. and uh, I'm, I'm not real interested in theoretical questions, more practical ones that affect the way we're going to live now. Okay, here's one from Ish. Are you promoting shock therapy, that is, actually going to hospital and getting that therapy? No, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, uh, let the hospitals decide that thing, you know, what to do. As I understand it, hospitals still do use shock therapy. Uh, the thing is that the person's anesthetized, and so um, you know, there's no no conscious memory uh, of what happened. They use it because it worked. You know, it did in the past, and it still does. Um, I'm not sure to what extent they use it. I mean, they've got other things now. Medication is probably one of the the better things. Uh, we as a community just tend to uh, go along with uh, the doctors in the hospital uh, for the most part in their treatments of things that. We don't really fully understand ourselves. And here's one from Noah. I'm just, I am diagnosed with schizophrenia and I struggle with double-mindedness. If I keep trying to follow the little I can barely, barely follow, is there still hope for me? Uh, well, hope is there till you die, you know. Um, but it's not going to save you. You know, what's going to save you is faith. Okay, so you struggle with double-mindedness. I'm, I'm not sure how schizophrenia comes into that because just about everybody struggles with double-mindedness. Um, and we, we need to be constantly working to overcome that, um, to not be a, a contradiction to ourselves. So you say, if I keep trying to follow the little that I can barely follow. No, wait a minute. I think there might be a little bit more that you could follow. See, I, I feel like what, what you're saying in this question is I want to just go on the way I am and, you know, uh, not grow. But, you know, if you're going to grow, then you're going to have to uh, deal with some uncomfortable things. You know, uh, the Bible terminology is the old man has to die for the new man to be born. And uh, schizophrenia is, is somewhat irrelevant, you know. Um, there's good medication for that these days. Uh, Christian support can help. Uh, definitely there's uh, cognitive therapy uh, where you can, uh, you know, sort of learn to recognize certain things. Uh, one of the little bits of counsel I give to people who are suffering from some sort of mental disturbances 
is to uh, try the spirits, test them, and you're going to find a lot of a lot of uh, these little voices, for example, are appealing to your ego, telling you, you know, uh, you're really special, you're really great. Uh, delusions of grandeur, you know, and it's pride. So, and we've all got to deal with pride. So, a schizophrenic has to deal with pride just at a at a different level, uh, and the other one's fear, or what we call paranoia, you know, in, in psychological terms. Um, and, you know, you've got to be able to look at yourself and, and say, well, I reckon that this, this little voice or this little uh, idea I have uh, is not rational. You know, uh, nobody did plant a microchip inside my brain or whatever it is, you know, that, those sorts of things that come. And, and a person doesn't have to be schizophrenic to, to have problems with paranoia. <laughs> I have to struggle with that, you know. Um, I get uh, I, I get a lot of uh, criticism, you know, very heavy criticism and and a certain amount of persecution. But you know, I can imagine if my uh, uh, computer breaks down, somebody hacked into it. You know, <laughs> somebody's uh, you know uh, doing all these things that that just kind of a little bit go beyond common sense and reason. So learn to be uh, reasonable and to to question anything that uh, is um, puffing yourself up. You know that you're you're really super special, one of the two witnesses, that kind of thing. Uh, but be very skeptical about that sort of thing, and be very skeptical about uh, fears. Well, anonymous is asking a lot of questions today. Uh, this is another one from anonymous. Do you have to live in one of your communities, or in any Christian community, to be saved? I don't save people, <laughs> so I don't make the rules. Okay, I do know you could be in one of our communities and not be saved. So you know that is not the the, the criteria. You know, God is looking at your heart. Okay, in particular, He's looking for how much do you listen to His Son and believe the things that His Son said. That's faith. You know, not faith in some doctrine that some some uh, priest or pastor told you. It's faith in God's Son. Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. Now, the, there's a lot of benefits of living in a community. And if it, if it seems like something you have to do, then you, you, you haven't heard the full story. You know? um, and, and it is sad that so many people approach salvation that way. What do I have to do? What's the minimum I can get by with? You know, well, get yourself dunked. You know? uh, that's, that's the kind of thing the churches say. You know, we'll fix you up. <laughs> we'll splash some water on you and you'll be saved. Or you'll say a magic prayer and we'll save you. No, you got to listen to Jesus and do the things he said. We just find uh, living in Christian community helps us to grow in love. Okay? Kind of makes us uh, like strengthening our love muscles uh, because we have to learn to be patient with one another. We have to learn to be humble and, and, and listen to each other. So I see living in community as a, as a great asset and if you think it's something you have to do, well, then you might as well, you're, you're on the wrong track to begin with. Okay, anonymous again. You speak against the churches quite a bit. Are you saying there are no real Christians in the churches? Uh, I think earlier in this, uh, in this live stream, I said something like, uh, no one, not anyone, and I repeated it. Um, I realize what I'm saying that, 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 yeah, there are exceptions. But the trouble is, you see, everybody wants to think they're the exception. And, and exceptions are exceptional. You know, they're rare. They're extreme. It's not like all the churches are wrong except my denomination. I just don't see any denomination. I don't see any pastor. You know, when I see a pastor who I think is teaching people to obey Jesus, I get excited. You know, I got very excited over Francis Chan for a while. I thought he was getting close, but, you know, in the end, they all seem to go back to, you know, working for money, and, and, and money's going to solve their problems, and very, very little gets done for God, and you can present almost any teaching of Jesus to any pastor or even church member you know of, and they're going to fight against it. You know, they'll say, yes, but uh, over in the, in the epistles it says this, or back in the, in the Torah it says that. Uh, and, and they'll just ignore and fight the teachings of Jesus. Now, you find someone who's not fighting the teachings of Jesus, let me know, okay? Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to say, uh, don't look for the answers in the churches. You're not going to find them. Something Mark 
controversial. Let's see what this is. It's from Ian. What do you think about someone having a girlfriend and you are to marry in three years? Um, can she cook? <laughs> How am I supposed to know? I don't know the girl. You know, I don't know the person. Uh, what do I think about people getting married? Well, that's their business. You know, people want to get married. Um, the Bible says in the last days there will be uh, false teachers who uh, forbid marriage. So nobody should forbid marriage. But Scripture uh, gives some pretty heavy injunctions about marriage. You know, you get one, and that's it. Now, I would very seriously question what you mean by girlfriend as well. In three years, so you're going to wait three years before you have sex? Is that what you're saying? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But I'm kind of wondering if that's really not what you're saying. There's just so much of this in the world today where we, you just hop into bed with anybody. And, and marriage is like, I don't know what it is. Why even bother it, you know? You know, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? Okay. Well, we've gone over an hour. Time flies, huh? All right, this one's from Joshua. And uh, we might have a few more, but I don't mind saving a few for next week. Okay? I mean, I think it's gone well enough. I'm, <laughs> I might hear otherwise from my, my minders uh, when I go off air. But I think it'd be kind of nice to do this again next week. And, uh, you know, we're all kind of getting a better idea of, of uh, how, how to make it move more smoothly. So Joshua has written this one. What did you find challenging when you stopped working for money and how did you overcome it? Um, well, I, I think the most challenging part for me had nothing to do with money. Uh, and, and this is the case, I think, with a lot of our members. The most challenging part is our loved ones. You know, uh, God wants to know that he comes before everybody else. And uh, our loved ones are the ones who will fight the hardest. So when I felt God was telling me to step out and live by faith, uh, I had to deal with my wife and kids, you know. And I didn't know quite what to do. But I, I said to my wife, well, you know, we didn't have much. We were, you know, sort of just renting a place. Um, had a car we were paying off, you know. But I said, look, there's a little bit of money there in the bank. But be very, very careful with that, okay, because I don't know if I'm going to be back. Uh, I'm going to start living the way Christians did in the Bible times. I was very fortunate. You know, I had to make that choice, and it was a difficult ch choice, but I was very fortunate in that my wife came to me later and said, you know, what are the chances of me going with you? You know, and uh, that's the way it's been ever since, and thank God for that. Um, the most common things for our, our younger members in particular, uh, but I, I don't know that, it, that the older members ever... Uh, get over this one either, is parents. And uh, there's a, a very controversial verse in uh, the 14th chapter of Luke where Jesus says that we need to hate our parents. Now, if you want a bit of more detail on that, uh, Google um, embarrassing uh, on our channel. And I have a channel here, Google embarrassing. It's the most embarrassing teaching of Jesus to tell us to hate our families, our, our, our wife, our kids, our brothers and sisters, our parents. I mean, obviously, that contradicts everything Jesus said about love. If we just, you know, look at it superficially like that, nevertheless, that is a word that he uses. It's not like if translators could change it to something else, they would. But what happens, you see, is that they're the ones who tell us that we're hating. You know, when we, when we put Jesus before our parents, that offends our parents, most of them anyway. <laughs> Strangely enough, the, uh, the parents that are, are most accepting are usually atheists. It's weird like that, because I guess it's just really convicting to professing Christians to have their own sons and daughters start calling them uh, you know, by their first name. But I, I was thinking recently, even uh, with these titles, you know, the, the titles are the ones that <laughs> upset them. If you go to a court, you're supposed to call the judge in most countries your honor. Okay, that's not a specific one that Jesus listed, but it's, a, it's a, the same spirit, that you're lifting this uh, judge up on a, on a pedestal. And if you don't say your honor, 
then that's called contempt of court. Now, you know what contempt means. You hate them. You hate the court. See, Because you don't put them on a pedestal, they tell you you're contempting them or you're hating them. And that's, that's what the parents say as well. Uh, so that's, that's a difficult one I think we all have to face. And sometimes it's just easy as uh, maybe kind of a, a chicken way out is uh, people will just avoid their parents you know, using a name of anything uh, rather than just say, hey, you, than to say George you know, you know, or Matilda uh, because parents just get so furious uh, at some of us when we, we call them by their first name. So yeah, the, the, biggest, the biggest cost for following Christ for me was uh, uh, family. Uh, I was grateful things worked out with my wife and our, our kids. Uh, but then, of course, later on, uh, some of the kids, as we mentioned in the answer to Brian Birmingham, uh, some of the kids turned against us, and, and that certainly broke our hearts. Uh, but, you know, we have to practice what we preach and, and let them be free to make their own choices. Well, what if we uh, leave it at that and uh, we'll just, you know, there's a few more questions sitting there in the box, uh, but I, I, I'd rather have these things be too short than too long. You know, people just get bored and they've got, to, I know you've got other things to do and you're busy. Uh, but I would look forward to uh, seeing you again next week, Sunday or Monday, depending on where you're living, and uh, we can share a little bit more. I'll end it there. Thank you.